best advice for women in business. Get your ass up and work. You guys are business women. Get, 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 get your ass up and work. That's Have so to true. And show up and do the work. Work, 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 work. work, work, work. You guys are business women. That's Have to so true. Work. Business has always been in our blood. 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 Work. Work. I have the best advice for women in business. Work, work, work. And show up and do the work. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. The Kardashians have built a girl boss empire. <laughs> Off of the idea of glamour, beauty, and effortless riches. You guys are business women! Just business has always been in our blood. All the while, the Kardashians have profited off of both the hate and the love for them. I do feel like people don't take me seriously as a businesswoman. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. That's Half so true. But what's behind the Kardashian empire is a dark truth. A reality far less glamorous. Are the Kardashians media and business geniuses? This lady has built her family into a celebrity marketing machine, the Kardashians. Are they shady and money hungry? According to TMZ.com, a group of people from New York have loved a lawsuit towards the Kardashian sisters for waging a campaign of lies. Did you trademark the term momager? I did. Yeah. Or are they the ultimate girl bosses, able to become media stars and own and operate several businesses? We're examining that today and looking through the graveyard of the Kardashians' failed businesses. Do you think that you are promoting unattainable standards of beauty in any way? No, I don't. Because I think we get up, we do the work, we work out, you know, Kendall, you have to think about what you're asking for because money doesn't grow on trees. Yes, it does. Paper. Life without cameras was a big change for us. Ow! 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 Move back! Oh, God. Did you did you get get you Before we get into the universe of the Kardashians and their many shady businesses, this video was sponsored by Function of Beauty. If you've been following my channel for a while, then you know the many different phases that my hair has gone through and the lots and lots of damage that has accompanied that. So I've been trying to grow out my hair and repair a lot of the damage that I've done to it over the years. On top of that, I have kind of slightly wavy hair and I also live in an extremely dry climate, so my hair is always really dry. I've known about Function of Beauty for a really long time and I thought that this was the perfect time to try Function of Beauty since I had so many specific hair care goals and needs. I knew that I needed a customizable formula. Function of Beauty creates and delivers customized hair care products based on each individual's hair types and goals. Each bottle of shampoo or conditioner is customized to each user's needs and inscribed with their name. My Function of Beauty bottles say Function of Happy Mind, which I think is adorable and makes me happy when I see it. And you can customize so many aspects of the product, which I love. You can choose what color you want your shampoo and conditioner to be. And I chose to have a blue shampoo and a purple conditioner so I could tell them apart in the shower. They also have a ton of different fragrances to choose from. I chose the eucalyptus fragrance, but if you're sensitive to fragrance, you can also choose unscented, which I think is an awesome feature. Function of Beauty is a dependable brand too. It's dermatologist tested, 
tested and every ingredient is extensively tested internally with voluntary participants and never on animals. Function of Beauty also has no parabens or sulfates and is 100% vegan and cruelty free. And now it's easier than ever to try Function of Beauty's top rated hair duo. You can get 20% off your first 16 ounce custom set when you click my link in the description. And you can become a member and get lots of exclusive perks like free shipping and early access to new products. Thank you so much to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. Sponsorships really help support my channel and allow me to invest more into my channel. So I really appreciate it. And thank you so much to anyone who clicks the link in my description and tries out Function of Beauty. I really hope that you enjoy the products as much as I have. And now let's dive into the world of the Kardashians and their many shady businesses. The Kardashians have taken quite a journey through starting out as reality TV stars that were seen as kind of a joke and also vapid and vain, to now being front and center in the high fashion industry, running multi-million dollar businesses with hundreds and hundreds of millions of followers combined on their social media platforms. In fact, the Kardashians have defined much of the fashion and social media cultures that we have today. Do you think that you are promoting unattainable standards of beauty in any way. No, I don't. They did no teeth affect the signs of heat. But this wasn't always the case. Robert Kardashian, the father of Courtney, Kim, and Chloe, was born in Los Angeles, California on February 22, 1944. Robert grew up in the affluent View Park area of Los Angeles County. Robert attended the University of Southern California, where he earned a degree in business administration. He also earned a JD degree from University of San Diego School of Law and practiced for about a decade, then after that went into business. In the spring of 1973, Chris, known then as Kristen Mary Hewton, was 17 years old and was dating pro golfer Cesar Sanudo. Born November 5, 1955, Chris lived in San Diego with her family and attended Claremont High School, where she graduated in 1973. While Cesar was out of town, Chris decided to go to the Del Mar racetrack in California, where she met 28 year old Robert Kardashian. For Robert, it was love at first sight. And by 1976, Robert was a high-profile lawyer, and he wanted to be with Chris, who was a flight attendant for American Airlines. But Chris rejected Robert's first marriage proposal, but he was persistent, and the second time he proposed, she accepted. The two were married in 1978, when Chris was only 22. They moved to Beverly Hills, where they had Kourtney Kardashian on April 18th of 1979, Kim Kardashian on October 21st of 1980, Khloe Kardashian on on June 27th of 1986 and Robert Kardashian Jr. on March 17th of 1987. According to the New York Times, the couple spent their weekends wearing Fila warm-up suits and playing tennis with their friends, American NFL star OJ Simpson and his wife at the time, Nicole Brown Simpson. But by the time that Chris was in her 30s, she'd become a bored housewife. She loved her family, Robert, and the life that Robert provided her, but felt that something was missing. And soon, Chris found the excitement that she craved in the arms of a lover, soccer star Todd Waterman. When Robert found out about the affair, he canceled her credit cards and ended the marriage. Soon, Chris became alienated from her friends, depressed, and miserable. And she later called the affair the biggest regret of her life. But despite their messy divorce, Robert and Chris were able to make amends. It seemed that everything was peaceful in the family until a very dark event occurred. And that was the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson. When their friend at the time, O.J. Simpson, was put on trial for the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson, Robert Kardashian was asked to be a part of the team that represented him. I, I understand that there was a lot of tension when he became O.J. Simpson's lawyer. Yes. Were you angry with him for defending him? For being on the defense team? I 
I wasn't angry. Once again, I was disappointed and I was confused. I didn't understand how he didn't see what I saw. And then husband Bruce Jenner talking to Inside Edition about the case during the trial, where they were regular spectators. I think that this has been a really tough year, for, you know, tough 15 months for all of us. Not only have we lost Nicole, we've lost OJ too. Chris was very close friends with Nicole, and many people at that time strongly, strongly believed that OJ was the one responsible for her death. During the trial, Chris sat in the courtroom, pregnant with her fifth child, and wore Nicole's hand-me-down maternity clothes in protest. Kendall Nicole Jenner was then born on November 3rd, 1995, and was given the middle name Nicole after Nicole Brown Simpson. Chris then gave birth to Kylie Kristen Jenner on August 10th, 1997. Robert was diagnosed with esophageal cancer in July of 2003 and died two months later on September 30th, 2003. That same year, Kim began working as a personal assistant for the hotel heiress Paris Hilton. During her employment with Hilton, Kim started to develop a close relationship with Paris, and this was all during a high point of Paris Hilton's fame. And this friendship started to boost Kim's personal fame as she appeared on episodes of Paris Hilton's reality show. Kim also began working for other celebrities in the early 2000s, further boosting her fame and establishing her connections. By 2006, Chloe, Kim, and Courtney ventured further into fashion, opening a high fashion boutique called Dash in Calabasas, California. Then, in February of 2007, a home tape that Kim made with American singer and songwriter Ray J years before was leaked to the public. Vivid Entertainments bought the right to this tape for one million dollars and released the film titling it Kim Kardashian Superstar. It's incredibly bizarre to me that this was done without Kim Kardashian's permission or consent. Or in a way, are you grateful for that? Experience. I'm definitely not grateful for that experience. I would say if I had one regret, that would be it. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to do it again, like live my life again, obviously I wouldn't do that again. Obviously I wouldn't have gotten married in that. You know, if I had known, if I had the information and I had known better, I would have done better. So, rightfully so, Kim sued Vivid Entertainment for ownership of the tape, but ended up dropping the suit in April of 2007, settling for $5 million. While Kim Kardashian and the Kardashian family in general received a lot of backlash for the leak, How did you feel? When that went public, I Thank cried God myself to sleep. It also boosted their fame and the family name into the spotlight and the mainstream public eye. And Chris, either having learned from her ex husband Robert or just through having a natural knack for business, decided to capitalize off of this rising fame. The idea of creating a reality series originated in 2006 when Chris Jenner showed an interest in appearing on a television show together with her family. Producer Ryan Seacrest, who had his own production company, decided to further develop this idea. He ended up hiring a cameraman to visit the Kardashian home. They were all together, as crazy and as fun-loving as they are. Seacrest described the family after seeing the tape. He later initiated the series by sharing the tape with E, and the show was eventually picked up. All right, we're ready. No, no, no. We're that's it we're done Money. the show titled keeping up with the kardashians premiered in october of 2007 the show centered around the members of the kardashian jenner blended family and mostly focused on the older sisters courtney kim and chloe and most episodes in the show have a pretty similar structure the family shows off their privileged lifestyle and maybe gets into one or two minor family squabbles before ultimately wrapping things up with a monologue 
that reinforces the importance of family. And I'm really thankful for my family. I grew up with so many siblings that I just love. Due to its high ratings, the series was renewed another season one month after the first season's premiere. One of the most unique things about the show Keeping Up With The Kardashians is before the reality show, the family really didn't have a lot of fame and notoriety on their own. Yes, they were fairly wealthy and fairly famous, but ended up forging their own name and brand through the reality TV show they created. Courtney at the time was studying in the University of Arizona, and the sisters Kim, Courtney, and Chloe had just launched their Dash clothing store. And when Keeping Up with the Kardashians premiered, it really propelled the family into fame. Suddenly, the Kardashian name was everywhere, and Keeping Up with the Kardashians has, without a doubt, been a major success. The Kardashian-Jenner sisters have hundreds of millions of followers on social media, a TV show in more countries than the Peace Corps, and a collective fortune bigger than the Kennedys. I don't know if Chris, Ryan, or the rest of the Kardashian-Jenner family truly planned for the amount of growth and reception the show was going to receive, but soon after the show premiered, the family skyrocketed into fame and became known as more than just LA socialites. They were now reality TV show stars. Get, 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 get fucking ass up and work. That's so just true. Don't you know. stop. <laughs> She has this ugly crying face. I love our dynamic with our mom. The momager who takes a 10% cut. <laughs> this isn't funny. <laughs> That's it, we're done. Usually, people become famous for doing something notable and then profiting off of that notoriety afterwards. But the Kardashians kind of worked backwards. The Kardashians built their fame first, associating with celebrities, doing a reality TV show, and then after that, tried to build notoriety through the various businesses that they ended up starting. The businesses that uh, you're involved with. So where did this passion for business come from? I worked for my dad in his office. I've worked in a clothing store since I was 15, and I had maybe not the most glamorous jobs of burning CDs and pressing CDs in his, in his record company. But all of those experiences were so amazing, and I just learned so much every single day working alongside my dad. And this business empire that they tried to build had a lot of complications and a lot of disasters. One of the most interesting things and one of the most unknown things about the Kardashians is the church that Kris Jenner founded. The Kardashians have always considered themselves to be very religious. Kris Jenner and her children are Christian and they all attended either a Presbyterian or a Catholic school growing up. But despite their public alignment with Christianity, people were still surprised to find out that in June 2008, Kris Jenner co-founded the California Community Church located in Agora Hills, California. The establishment is front by a formerly disgraced pastor named Brad Johnson. Before Johnson signed on to be the pastor of the Kardashians' church, he led a 4,000-person congregation called Calvary Community Church in Westlake Village, California, until his personal tribulations exploded in a cheating scandal, and Johnson left the congregation. He began working at a local Starbucks until the day Chris and Bruce Jenner tracked him down and convinced him to lead their church, which was then called the Life Change Community Church. Almost from the start, the ministry faced criticism from those who believed it was only a money-making venture and nothing more than a Kardashian tax haven. The church's website, for example, prominently features donation portals, with past requests that church members donate as much as $1,000 per month or 10% of their income. Kim appeared to confirm her family's interest in the church in a 2011 interview with Piers Morgan. My mom has helped create a church, so we help fund that, she said. Kim further explained that she donated 
millions each year to her mother's church, which would make it a tax-deductible donation under U.S. federal law. Though the Kardashian families and the church's tax records are both private, the company that Kim used for charitable donations in 2012 has public records. They showed that, despite a surface promise to donate proceeds from an eBay auction of old clothes to charity, Kim used fine print to deflect the total she would actually donate. Of the 399500 the auction raised, only 19975 exactly 5%, went to the charity, and the charity was the church that her mother owns. Not only that, but members are paying $1,000 a month to be members, and it's unclear where that money goes. And a lot of people have theorized that it goes right back into the Jenner Kardashians' pockets. Before Dash, there was Smooch, a children's clothing store that Courtney and Chris opened and operated in 2003. The company was seen multiple times during season one of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, but ended up closing shortly after. They decided to close Smooch in 2009 after running it for six years. Jillian has gotten some gifts from this lovely little store for Ben and Elsie. It's a wonderful boutique up in Calabasas, and it's run by a very famous mother and daughter. What little girl would love this dress? Is that cute? Smooch in Calabasas is a kid's boutique for newborns to young teens, run by Kris Jenner and daughter Courtney. Then, by 2010, Courtney Kardashian was sued by another children's clothing company. The lawsuit was filed on July 1st of 2010 in Van Nuys, California, by Flowers by Zoe, naming Courtney as a defendant alongside Smooch. The lawsuit was listed as a complaint for money, and the clothing company was seeking damages for non payment, meaning that Smooch and Kourtney Kardashian never paid this company for their services. The hearing was scheduled for January 3rd, 2011, but the outcome of this hearing was never published online. The Kardashians decided to move on to a different clothing venture, their company Dash. Dash was a boutique clothing and accessory chain founded in 2006 by the Kardashian sisters. The Kardashians opened their first Dash clothing store in Calabasas, California in 2006 and after the success of their reality show, they relocated the store to Los Angeles. The clothing store was seemingly doing very well and they ended up opening two more locations, one in Miami and one in New York, expanding their reality TV and fashion empire. Expanded our stores first to Miami. <laughs> And then New York. Each opening gets bigger and bigger. It's taken a long time, almost a decade, to really get our stores to what they are now and we have no plans of really slowing down. In an interview with Variety in 2015, Kim Kardashian disclosed that initially she wanted Keeping Up with the Kardashians to focus more on the Dash stores in order to bring publicity to the fashion stores. Dash's retail stores appeared on the reality TV series many different times, helping create more awareness of the fashion stores and associating it with the reality TV brand that the Kardashians were building. Chloe even reflected on Dash's origins on her app, writing, We started Dash in 2006 and really struggled for a long time to make it a successful business. There were months that we couldn't pay our bills, and the store didn't turn a profit for years. After my dad died in 2003, I was partying all the time, drinking a lot, and sleeping in every morning. At this time, my mom and Courtney were running their kids' store Smooch, and when the space next door opened up, Court got it. She saw that I was spiraling and wanted to give me responsibility, a reason to wake up in the morning. So she told me I was going to help her run a new store. Fast forward to today and all of the sisters' lives look completely different than those early beginnings. For a long time, Dash was a source of steady income for the Kardashians and was even the source of a shortly lived spin-off reality series titled Dash Dolls, which premiered on E! in September of 2015. Yeah. 
But the Dash boutiques have not been without many scandals of their own. In 2016, the stores were sued for discrimination by an employee who is legally blind and claimed that the stores were inaccessible. Then TMZ reported that their New York store closed that same year due to high rent. And as the Kardashians grew more and more in fame and notoriety, each of the Kardashian members ended up branching off and creating their own clothing line, collaborations, or other product lines. And soon maintaining the Dash stores became kind of pointless and just another added expense. So the Kardashians made the decision to close the Dash stores in early 2018. After 12 years, the sisters have decided to close the doors to Dash for good. Yesterday, Kim made the announcement on her app and tweeted out saying, quote, bittersweet after an amazing 12 years. In the statement, Kim said, quote, we've loved running Dash, but in the last few years, we've all grown so much individually. And as of April 2018, all stores have closed down after 11 years of being open. Then on April 20th of 2018, Racked posted an article written by Rebecca Jennings titled, The 20 Most Brutal Yelp Reviews Explain the Death of Dash. Jennings alleged that the main reason Dash closed was due to a massive decline in revenue and outlined many, many problems associated with the stores, including tons of negative reviews that the stores had. Whether it was low quality clothing, lousy service, expensive items, or an unsanitary store. Overall, it was clear that the Kardashians just started completely neglecting the Dash stores, leading to their eventual closure. For a long time, Super Bowl advertisements have been one of the most exciting parts of the Super Bowl to some, and with millions of viewers tuned into the game, it's one of the most desired spots for advertisements. On February 7th of 2011, Kim Kardashian appeared in a Super Bowl ad for Skechers Shape Ups, sneakers that the brand claimed would help customers tone their body and get into shape. The ad was filled with lots of sexual innuendos and shows Kim Kardashian breaking up with her personal trainer, claiming she doesn't need him anymore thanks to Skechers shape ups. I don't really know how to say this other than to just say it. You're amazing. The best I've ever had. But things just aren't working out. Well, that's not completely true. I am working out. It's not someone else. It's something else. Bye bye, trainer. Hello, shape ups. Nice Following the advertisement, Skechers Shape Ups actually became a massive thing. I don't know if anyone else remembers the time that Shape Ups blew up, but I remember that every single one of my friend's moms owned a pair of Skechers Shape Ups, and everyone seemed to think it was going to increase their fitness level by like tenfold. We're definitely going to start shaping up with the Kardashians, and we're so excited to be a part of this company and this brand and this amazing technology. I really like the product. It works. And so I really am honored to be a part of it and to be, you know, the face of Skechers. We have a lot of fun surprises in store and I won't give away all of our secrets, um, but we have some really exciting fun stuff that we're going to do that'll probably be different than any other ad campaign that you guys have seen before. We've always worked out together as a family, so it's, it really is a perfect fit, you know, the Kardashians and Skechers. Giving Skechers Shape Ups is the ultimate gift of health. I mean, there couldn't be a better gift. From the Skechers Fitness Group, Shape Ups have changed the way millions of people walk, work, play, and train. Shape Ups are revolutionary. Shoes with comfort and style designed to make you more fit, healthier, and yes, happier. But as time passed, customers began to express their displeasure with the results of the shape-ups and even reported back pain from the odd shape of the shoes. On May 16th of 2012, the Federal Trade Commission announced that they had determined Skechers lied about clinical studies which claimed that their shape-ups helped people lose weight and strengthen muscles in the butt, legs, and stomach. Claims that they used Kim Kardashian to help them advertise. The Federal Trade Commission is now saying the notion of putting on these shoes in lieu of working out isn't quite working out like Skechers advertised. 
As a result of what the FTC calls deceptive advertising, Skechers now has to foot a $40 million bill. Most of that money will go to consumers who paid as much as $100 for these and three other brands of toning shoes, but wound up feeling like only their wallets ended up leaner. So let me remind marketers once again, either shape up your substantiation or tone down your claims. After being exposed for making false claims, Skechers agreed to pay $40 million in settlement costs. Shapeups remained on the Skechers website, but the company's description no longer claimed that the shoes toned legs. While I wouldn't necessarily say that it's Kim Kardashian's sole fault and responsibility for not accurately reporting the findings of the Skechers Shapeup shoe and not being honest about the Skechers Shapeup capability, because how is Kim Kardashian going to be able to know that the clinical studies that Skechers had were a complete lie? I do think that this was was the beginning of a larger pattern that Kim Kardashian and the other Kardashians started to display of lying about health benefits and promoting health and wellness products that are seen as shady and fraudulent. Around this time, the Kardashians also launched a debit card that I remember some random YouTuber talked about a while ago. The Kardashian credit card until reading about it. They tried to open up a credit card. First Defender may be the new Kardashian card, named for the reality show Celebutons. It's marketed to teenage girls. With this one, you don't need credit, you don't even need a bank account. But you do need a lot of money for fees. A six-month card costs $59.95 just to set up, $1.50 to use the ATM, $1 for balance checks, $1.50 to speak to customer service, $9.95 to replace a lost card, and $6 to cancel the account. If you don't use the money that's in there, they actually deduct it or they, they charge you. And overall, this was sort of the beginning or early days of the Kardashians profiting off of even the little fame that they had through half thought out or poorly thought out business ventures, sponsorships, and partnerships. Quick Trim was a weight loss diet pill available in a 14 and 28 day cleanse system and a thermogenic stimulant formula. Kim and Chloe Kardashian. Odom. Yeah. This is Odom. Thank you. Jeez, good morning, guys. <laughs> wow. As soon as they came in this morning, they were working the phones, working the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These two, you guys are business women. Quick Trim, you guys are always doing something different. Oh, I was right. re reading the label on that big bottle. There's a lot of just a lot of berries and good stuff in there. There's not, you know, it's not more caffeine or they're all natural. And the caffeine it is, it is just green tea or like black licorice extract. It's all natural stuff. They were claimed to promote a healthy weight, a healthy metabolism, and increase energy. The detox formula also claimed to make weight loss easier by supposedly flushing out the system during sleep all sounds super legit. And the Kardashian sisters had been associated with the Quick Trim brand since 2009, carefully name-dropping the brand during television and magazine interviews, and telling their fans how they used the brand to lose weight and stay thin. You have the power to reinvent yourself. You can change the way you look. I'm a mother of four, and when I turned 40, it was time for me. With Quick Trim, I got my body back. I lost 30 pounds and I feel fantastic. I love my curves, but when I found myself buying a size 16, I had to make a change. I went from a size 16 down to a size 6 and look at me now. Quick trim. Create the body you deserve. She's like my idol. She is fabulous. She's strong. She's confident. She's gorgeous. Everything. My dream is to meet Kim, so let me begin. If I want a sexy hot bar, I need to drink quick trim. Wow. She's a great ambassador for Quick Trim. She's got a gorgeous body. She's healthy. Quick Trim is a perfect product for her and um, probably a perfect product for a lot of us. 
And of course, this was the early days of, I guess what you could call influencer marketing, when there wasn't a lot of crackdown rules or awareness on the tactics of how people were promoting various brands. And you could say that early reality TV stars were kind of like original influencers. Reality TV stars became famous through sharing their daily life, kind of like the influencers of today. And like influencers of today, the Kardashians promoted the Quick Trim brand through tweets as well. Just did an amazing Pilates class with at Kim Kardashian. Chloe tweeted to her fans in 2010, that and a little Quick Trim in my bikini bod will be ready in no time. In early 2013, New York-based law firm Bursar & Fisher reportedly filed a $5 million class action lawsuit against Chloe, Kim, and Courtney on behalf of four customers who say that the Kardashians made unsubstantiated claims about the benefits of quick trim. During that time, the FDA had recently evaluated the ingredients of the product and found the main ingredient of quick trim to be just caffeine, which the FDA determined was not a safe or effective treatment for weight loss. Attorneys for the four plaintiffs slammed the Kardashians and product maker Windmill Health for making outlandish claims like that quick trim curbs cravings, promotes weight loss, and burns calories. The suit also took issue with the advertising of the product, which encouraged using the full quick trim system for the most effectiveness when there was no evidence to support that conclusion. A federal United States magistrate ended up dismissing the lawsuit because a separate settlement was reached in a a similar California class action case. But in a separate class action lawsuit filed against the Kardashians and Quick Trim, a settlement was reached. According to the terms of the settlement in which Quick Trim and the Kardashians denied any wrongdoing, customers that bought the diet pills from the company website could receive a 50% refund. On top of that, Quick Trim agreed to redesign its packaging to restate the nature of its products and its benefits. But this is definitely not the last time that the Kardashians promoted shady, shoddy diet products and well, diet scams. Literally every single Kardashian has promoted Fit Tea products, which are literally the same thing, basically just caffeine and or laxatives, and which numerous health experts have debunked and have stated to not take as a means of effective weight loss. Detox teas and miracle supplements are bullshit. These products are not cleared by the FDA. Supplements are not treated like pharmaceutical medications. They, first of all, don't need to prove that they work. And second, they don't even need to prove that they're safe. I'm gonna be 100% transparent with you. All of these tea companies have reached out to me numerous times trying to get my endorsement for money, to have me tell you that these products are gonna help you lose weight, look great, feel more energized, suppress your appetite. I will not do that. It's not true. It doesn't hold up as fact, as science, and ultimately my job as a doctor, my responsibility is to you at home. The Kardashians have also promoted belly bands, which some people swear by. There was also the skinny lollipops that Kim Kardashian promoted on Instagram one time, and also just many, many other weight loss products and supplements that the Kardashians have promoted that would probably take too long to mention even in this one video. The Kardashians have gotten in a lot of backlash for promoting these types of companies. The Kardashian clan has made its money over the past 20 years from deceiving the public, putting out photoshopped images, from selling diet pills that don't work, selling beauty products that don't work, and finally when we see what they actually look like. So we can get an idea how these diet products and these beauty products work, then the picture has to be taken down. Yes. I got suckered into buying one diet pill one time and it didn't work. And you're like, oh my God, this is, this is the best. It's going to make you so slim. This is what we use. No, it isn't. And yet continue to do it. They brazenly continue to promote these types of health companies, knowing that they'll receive backlash, but I guess the money is just too good. On top of that, the Kardashians have a lot of young people that look up to them and will follow suit on whatever they promote. 
one of the things that the Kardashians are most known for is creating a new unattainable beauty standard. It's just exploitation of these obvious flaws in our culture. They didn't start it. There were these flaws in our culture long before they came around. There's the beauty myth, which sort of touches on this. But it, over the past 14 years, 15 years, it has just gone into overdrive. Beauty is a double-edged sword. People who are beautiful, they form their identities around being beautiful. And so when they lose their beauty, they start to lose their minds because they're like, well, what am I now if I'm not beautiful? You're a human. You're a human with hobbies and interests and a family that loves you and doesn't care how you look. The incredible hourglass figure that the Kardashians have and who's known to be one of the most impressionable demographics when it comes to advertisements, young girls are. So a lot of young girls probably saw these weight loss advertisements and decided to purchase from these companies hoping to become like one of the Kardashians. When in reality, much of the Kardashian beauty standard is created off of literally Photoshop and plastic surgery, something that the general public can't afford. It's literally taking an unattainable beauty standard to a whole new level because you have to be willing to pour in thousands and thousands into plastic surgeons and getting risky surgeries in order to look like a Kardashian. And then the Kardashians took this unattainable beauty standard that they created and turned it into profit for themselves by promoting diet products and weight loss supplements and trying to convince their fans that the way to get the Kardashian body is through purchasing these various items themselves. There's been some incredible commentary videos about the danger of the Kardashian beauty standard and the unrealistic nature of it all that I'll definitely be linking in the description below. They did low-key affect the standards of beauty. Like the Kardashians have been a blessing and a curse. A blessing because they've helped people find confidence in their body type. And a curse because I also feel like People who don't look like them feel like they should look like them and you shouldn't have to change your way to please somebody else. All the skinny girls watching this, you shouldn't have to be slim, thick or thick just because you see that body type being praised in the media or just because you see that men want it. And in my opinion, as far as general harm to society goes, I think that this aspect of the Kardashians was the most harmful and was the most damaging to girls of younger generations. But this was only one aspect where the Kardashians tried to make money. And it seems that the Kardashians tried to expand into almost every single venture you possibly could expand into. And one area that they tried to go into was creating different talk shows. The first to attempt to do this was Kris Jenner, who tried to create a talk show in 2013. In July of 2013, Fox Network decided to broadcast Kris Jenner's new talk show, Kris, also known as Kris Jenner Show. The show was announced to appear shortly after a barrage of Kardashian family-related stories clogged the internet pages. While the Kardashians are no strangers to publicity, it was definitely unusual during that time the sheer amount of stories that had come out coincidentally around the same time Kris Jenner was coming out with a talk show and it's rumored that Kris's secret skill set is her ability to drum up publicity in this manner and work with a lot of media outlets to get Kardashian stories published. Reporter Holly McKay was one of the people that noted how unusual the amount of publicity that the Kardashian family was getting was at that time. On certain websites almost every article was about the Kardashians. All these various stories stories all leaked a week before the show. One industry insider told Fox 411's Pop-Tarts column, it's a carefully crafted attempt to make sure that all of these items are left unanswered so that people tune in on Monday to see what's going on. Chris even hinted that Kanye West and Kim Kardashian's first daughter, Northwest, would be shown on the talk show for the very first time. Hi, I'm Chris Jenner. And I'm a mom with a pretty active family. When we're all just hanging out, that's my favorite time. Lots of laughs, great conversation. And I thought that would make for a great talk show. So, Chris premieres July 15th. You're in for a good time. 
Kris Jenner gained a lot of industry insider connections, which she made sure to utilize through carefully constructed publicity that sort of benefits both parties. If you go to paparazzi with an interesting story, it benefits them to be able to break that story. Yet also you get to control the narrative of your family and how they're being perceived by the public and when their stories are leaked. Chris premiered on July 15th, 2013 on Fox. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris The show released 10 separate one-hour episodes and finished its six-week trial on August 23rd of 2013. One of the most notable moments on the show was when Kanye West appeared as a guest, Kanye West appeared as a guest, where he, for the very first time, released photos of himself and Kim Kardashian's daughter, Northwest. And I think to you just, you know, stop all of the noise and, 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 that would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, on, um, I thought it would be really cool, like, on, you know, her grandmother's season finale to... <laughs> This episode had the highest ratings of the six-week test run and was Kanye's first television appearance in three years. But after the show had concluded, reports surfaced in August that Kris Jenner's talk show had been canceled after its initial six-week trial run. This inside source also revealed that Kris's daytime show suffered such poor ratings that the network was adamant that there was no chance she would be picked up for a second season. The ratings were averaging an abysmal 0.8, and advertisers were less than enthusiastic about it, the source added. Chris did get a ratings bump for her last show when Kanye West revealed the first baby pic of Daughter Northwest with Kim, but that was a one-time shot in the arm and it wouldn't be indicative of what the ratings trend would be. So on January 17th, 2014, Fox officially announced that the show had been canceled. Meanwhile, another source confirmed to Raider Online, Chris has been told her talk show is not going to happen. Viewers just tuned out and genuinely don't want to see her on daytime television in any format, which is pretty harsh. Something I never knew or even imagined was a thing is that Kylie Jenner and Kendall Jenner actually wrote a sci-fi novel, believe it or not. Wrote if you know what I mean. On June 3rd of 2014, Kendall and Kylie Jenner published a science fiction dystopian novel titled Rebels, City of Indra, the story of Lex and Livia. And despite being the only credited authors, believe it or not, I know it's surprising, Kendall and Kylie never did any of the writing at all. I know, shocking, right? Look what we've got, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I wanted to learn firstly more about who actually has written this. And it soon became apparent there are a lot of hands working in this mess. <laughs> Kendall and Kylie Jenner are obviously the authors on the front. And then when you turn in, you have and Elizabeth Kilman Roman with Maya Sloan. Two famous reality TV star teenagers didn't fully write an entire sci-fi novel by themselves? Who would have ever thought? The book was written entirely by a ghostwriter named Maya Sloan. Upon release of the book, customer reviews on Amazon give the book a rating average of 3.9 out of 5 stars. 
However, despite the Jenner's popularity and influence, the book did not receive the attention it hoped and resulted in less than impressive book sales. According to data from the Nielsen Book Scan obtained by Raider Online, the sci-fi novel has sold a mere 13,000 copies since its release. In comparison, fellow reality star Lauren Conrad's two novels sold close to 500,000 copies about a year after publication. Despite Kendall and Kylie having done promotions and book signings in LA and New York, uh, this is your book. You just decide, this is what the, you guys do. The Kardashians, the Jenners, they go, I, I want to do something, and you just go out and you just do it. You go out and you want to write a book, and you do it. Got one life to live, why not? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to do a cameo on One Life to Live. Like, we're really close, things. Is that stress still on? I don't know. Um. And even talking about the book on the talk show The Talk in June of 2014. Just thought of a movie a idea, and then we were yeah. like, why not put it into a book? We love action. So, we love what kind, stuff yeah, like what kind that, of movies so. do you like? We, I mean, we're really into everything, but um, we just like had thought of something that would be fun for us to write, and something different, something that not some, that someone wouldn't expect from us. So. Obviously, Chris Jenner saw the design, edited another interview. This isn't specifically about this book, it's about the sequel. <laughs> um, it's a series of little short videos they've done on both Kylie and Kendall's YouTube channels. And it becomes clear to me that at least Kylie made an effort to know what this book is about because she'll say things to Kendall that are key to the plot or about these characters. Kendall will have no idea what she's talking about and have to pretend like she did know what she was talking about. Olivia, because Olivia is like, she has heightened senses. She oh, can tell when people are coming in around oh, her. Right, right, right. Okay. Despite the poor reviews, the sisters came out with a sequel to this book, which received better ratings but seemed to do even worse commercially. So I think it's safe to say that the sisters' endeavors as writers just never really panned out. The Kardashian family opened Kardashian Chaos at the Mirage Hotel and Casino in November of 2011. Felix Rappaport, president and COO of the Mirage, said, It's hard to think of a brand that embodies fun, energy, and excitement better than the Kardashian brand. This store, which fashioned itself as a celebrity lifestyle boutique, sold a collection of Kardashian souvenirs, including keychains, water bottles, and other novelty items an entire store dedicated to just basically Kardashian merchandise at a casino. Sounds like a good business plan. The website for the store stated, The Kardashian Chaos online store includes specialty, made-to-order gifts, apparel, exclusive souvenirs, and lots of fun one-of-a-kind items. Enjoy shopping. The entire Kardashian family joined together at the Mirage Casino and Hotel for the grand opening of Kardashian Chaos. So here's the Mavar, Nicole, my OPA polish, and this is my favorite color. It's called Follow Me on Twitter. My favorite color is Chloe had a little lamb lamb. It's like a deep, balmy green color. It's pretty bad. I love Follow Me on To be fair, the store definitely does sound a little bit chaotic. Since the store's initial opening, the sisters would occasionally make appearances at the store. However, after only three years, it was announced that the Kardashian's Las Vegas boutique, Kardashian Chaos, would be permanently shutting down. Although no official reason was given behind the closure, it's pretty much believed that poor sales were the reason for the closure. Believe it or not, not a lot of people wanted to go to a dedicated Kardashian souvenir store. I know who saw that coming. And this is where my mind is just blown because despite the fact that so many stores were performing poorly and not doing well, and so many business ventures of the Kardashians were failing because of their fame and massive following that they had amassed, the Kardashians were still able to partner with large and massive brands and still able to bring in a lot of money from these partnerships. People still believed in the Kardashian name and the Kardashians 
Kim's ability to sell, despite the fact that most of the things they sold resulted in lawsuits or ended up shutting down or discontinuing. Kardashian Collection was a fashion line by the Kardashian sisters Courtney, Kim, and Chloe, launched in 2011. The Kardashian Collection included everything from accessories to shoes, denim, swimwear, clothing, intimates, and home lines stored at Sears. And initially, it looked like this clothing line was actually doing really well and pulling in great sales numbers. And it seemed that the clothing line stood a chance to compete with other major retailers. The best part of tonight is just seeing our dream really come to reality. I mean, we've planned this for so long and just even being out there and seeing the backdrop with our name and our logo. I mean, this is what we really dreamed of our whole lives. Just knowing that our pre-sale sold out, that was like so exciting to us. That's like what, you know, we've always you hope that for the line, but you don't really think it's going to happen. So we were just like, oh my god, also that we could believe it. We've been holding out for so long because we wanted a line that's for our fans, something that you're not, we're not sacrificing quality and fabrics just to hit a price point. We still get every single thing we want. We worked in retail from our stores, so we know how much fabrics really cost. The Kardashians were also seen and photographed wearing their Kardashian collection almost everywhere they went, which generated a ton of free publicity initially for the clothing line. And since it was sold at Sears and priced at a fairly reasonable price, the general public was able to purchase these clothes and it was more accessible to more people. So it seemed like initially the perfect business with all the right ingredients. However, it wasn't long until the Kardashians started receiving a lot of bad press regarding their Sears collection. Many were upset over the really poor material that was used to stitch the clothes, with many demanding their money back. On top of that, TMZ claimed an investigation was going on at the Chinese factories where the fashion line was being produced, with insiders claiming workers behind the Kardashian collection were earning no more than one dollar per hour and would work up to 84 hours a week. The Kardashian family was estimated to have made 60 million dollars from 2011 to 2012, so it was kind of ridiculous and very scandalous that the Kardashians were allowing this to go on. The TMZ publication that posted about the workers behind the Kardashian collection wrote, The Kardashians are in bed with some pretty bad people. Charles Kernigan, the executive director of the Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights told Star Magazine via RaiderOnline.com. Not only are celebrities like the Kardashians taking advantage of these workers, they're holding hands with a government that spits on democracy and human rights. This negative publicity and poor quality products affected the brand dramatically, and in 2013, it was reported that the line had declined significantly regarding its social appeal. To the point where Sears had to decrease prices of the collection to bargain basement levels, with some items as low as $8 and $9. Then in May 2015, Sears announced that it parted ways with the Kardashians, and all the remaining clothes of the Kardashian collection were sold at discount prices for the rest of the year. Despite the bad press and customer feedback, the cheaply made clothing line still made the Kardashians a lot of money, until its eventual implosion. In early 2020, the New York Times conducted an interview with Kim Kardashian where she spoke about Kardashian collection and the Kardashians clothing partnership with Sears. Kim told the New York Times that she and her sisters received a 6% cut of proceeds from the product in that deal. However, the three sisters split that amount, giving them each just a 2% cut, and that was still before they each had to pay 15% of their take to their agents and an additional 10% to their mother slash manager, Kris Jenner. Kim also explained that they were flying from city to city, country to country to promote the line, yet had little to no control over the quality of the products. Basically saying that the poor quality and working conditions of those producing the line was not the Kardashians' responsibility. Which I could definitely see both ways. If you're the face behind a brand, you definitely have some responsibility there in ensuring that your line is 
ethical and to a certain quality that your fans probably expect and deserve. But also, I understand that being a face of a brand, if you're just the face and you have no authority or power over the brand itself and the products and creation, then of course it can be hard to monitor all aspects of that brand. So overall, it seems that the Kardashians allowed themselves to be a part of a bad business deal. The dynamic that the Kardashians have created really illustrates the society that we're currently living in. They do a lot of really strange giveaways, basically promising these luxurious prizes to their audience so they can live like them. They promote diet products so people can look like them, fashion lines so people can wear clothes like them. Most of what they've done is through building an image and then trying to get their fans to want to be like them, to want to replicate them. But all the while, they're just getting more and more money off of their fans and supporters. While in more recent years, Kim Kardashian specifically has been doing more philanthropic work, I still can't help but feel like most of the Kardashian fortune was literally built off of taking money away from their supporters and not really giving their supporters anything back of quality in return. Greenlit on July 21st, 2015, Cocktails with Chloe, a talk show hosted by Chloe Kardashian, was ordered eight one-hour episodes and commenced production immediately after the announcement. Each week on Cocktails with Chloe, when the guest list is put together, my goal is to have a group of people that don't necessarily know each other, but I know we're each going to bring a lot to the table. The show was produced in part by Chloe Kardashian herself. Filmed in Los Angeles, California, Cocktails with Chloe premiered on the FYI cable channel on January 20th, 2016. But by April 2016, FYI had canceled Cocktails with Chloe after only one season. In a statement issued to The Hollywood Reporter, bosses at FYI and Pilgrim Media Group insisted that despite the cancellation, Cocktails with Chloe had been good for the channel. The sudden cancellation of Chloe Kardashian's talk show series primarily shocked media watchers because the ratings were high. But behind the scenes, the show was chaos, sources told Page Six. Cocktails with Chloe was a commercial success for the network FYI since its debut. It averaged 24% more views than a show in the same slot a year ago, and online it netted the most views in the channel's history. But an insider said that Cocktails was chaos. Nobody agreed with anyone about what it should be or what direction it should be going. Yesterday was a sad day for Miss Khloe Kardashian. Less than three months after its debut, FYI and Pilgrim Media Group announced that her talk show Cocktails with Chloe has officially been canceled. It sounds like the official announcement from the network is that the show is on indefinite hold, which is just a veiled way of saying that the show is done. And while there is no word on who decided to pull the plug, rumor has it both sides were unhappy with how things were going. TMZ reports that Chloe wanted to focus on her other jobs and had no interest in shooting the next season. And network execs could see that she checked out and they weren't happy about it. Another source said Chloe rubbed some of the staffers the wrong way. Insiders also claimed that both Chloe and executives were unhappy, telling TMZ Chloe had checked out and had no interest in shooting another season. Despite these reports, Chloe took to Twitter and tweeted, I'm not going anywhere. An article by Nikki Swift was posted on March 7th, 2018, that outlined what went wrong with cocktails with Chloe. One of the most significant issues discussed was the talk show's lack of critical success. The New York Daily News called the show complete crap, giving it one out of five stars. One review explained that the show's directional aspects were lacking, writing, this show needs a better structure. Everyone talks at the same time, to the point where you have no idea what's going on. So Cocktails with Chloe couldn't find a direction or an area where everyone involved would agree on something, so it just fizzled out and died. Chloe Chloe also did a show called Revenge Body, which debuted in 2017 and follows Chloe Kardashian as she works alongside a team of trainers to help individuals work towards a healthier lifestyle and then confront individuals in their lives who discouraged or belittled them. You started at 5 and now you're at 30. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yeah, I want to be my own superhero again. God damn. I've lost a lot of the anxiety 
and getting this closure for the Jess feels like a weight is lifted off which is kind of a weird message it's basically get healthy and get a quote-unquote better body so that you can prove to others how wrong they treated you as opposed to just doing it for yourself in your own fulfillment like that's just I don't know if that's a good message it's just me the show had three seasons but it doesn't look like at the moment that a fourth season will come the show was pretty widely well received so it wasn't necessarily a failure compared to the other talk show attempts that the Kardashians have done. Live For Now, also known as Live For Now Moments Anthem, is a 2017 short film commercial for Pepsi featuring Kendall Jenner in the song Lions by Skip Marley. And this was probably one of, if not the most poorly received commercials to ever exist in modern times. The commercial began with a cellist on a rooftop. Outside, young people are marching, displaying V signs and carrying signs, including one that says, join the conversation. Jenner's character is first seen in the commercial modeling at a photo shoot. Jenner removes a blonde wig, wipes off her dark lipstick, and heads towards the march. Several police officers are standing in a line formation watching the march approach them. Jenner appears in a more casual outfit and walks up to the police officers, handing one of the officers a can of Pepsi. After the police officer drinks from the can, the crowd cheers enthusiastically. The photographer puts aside her camera and hugs someone nearby in celebration. Peace for all with Pepsi. So yeah, this ad basically was boiling down a message of it'll all get fixed with Pepsi and it was just a really weird take and a really strange approach. Basically a brand trying to do some sort of performance activism that was just really not their place and just not executed well at all and everyone saw right through it immediately. And the company pulled the advertisement literally one day after its distribution due to criticism. The advertisement's creators were widely criticized on social media and by media outlets for attempting to capitalize on imagery imitating protests in the Black Lives Matter movement. The company released a statement saying, Pepsi was trying to project a global message of unity, peace, and understanding. Clearly, we missed the mark and we apologize. We did not intend to make light of any serious issue. We are removing the content and halting any further rollout. We also apologize for putting Kendall Jenner in this position. Pepsi's decision to apologize to Kendall Jenner did not sit well with activists either because Kendall Jenner chose to partake in the ad. She was not forced, she was not misled. This was her own decision and therefore as an adult woman she should probably take responsibility for that as well. And Kendall Jenner did not publicly respond to that outrage for six months and her response wouldn't come until the 14th season premiere of Keeping Up with the Kardashians which you have to wonder if it was kind of used as a way to get more viewers on the show because people wanted a response so instead of doing it publicly they made people wait until the reality show premiere to get an answer from Kendall. That's just my theory but it seems that the Kardashians have mastered the ability to use public outrage for their own promotion. On top of that, Caitlyn Jenner ended up doing an interview on a radio show where she claimed that Kendall Jenner had seen and approved of the script for the ad beforehand. Someone calls me with more bad news like every five minutes. It's just so stressful. I just felt so stupid. The fact that I would offend other people or hurt other people was definitely not the intent. I genuinely feel like I have no idea how I'm going to bounce back from it. This is the first time you've had a scandal. The only thing you can really do is just be like real and honest because you can't ignore it. So the claims of naivety that Kendall Jenner was sort of insinuating weren't entirely accurate. She knew what she was getting into, she just didn't really have the depth and maybe even her privilege blinded her where she couldn't really see the offensiveness of this ad.
In 2012, the Jenner sisters teamed up with Paxum to start their Kendall and Kylie brand. Now, the once collaboration has turned into a global lifestyle brand. The site, which offers a variety of clothing options, features numerous images of the Jenner duo. The prices range from $30 for a top to nearly $170 for a pair of sunglasses and $180 for a pair of shoes. Since Kendall and Kylie are the youngest of the Kardashians, a lot of young girls look to them the most for style inspiration. So with this clothing brand, fans could purchase items the sisters supposedly handpicked themselves. And while Kendall and Kylie are focused on different projects these days, the brand still generates significant revenue. But the brand wasn't without its controversy. On June 28, 2017, Kendall and Kylie decided to release a limited edition vintage t-shirt collection that featured legendary musicians such as Tupac Shakur, The Notorious B.I.G., Pink Floyd, Jim Morrison, Kiss, and Metallica, superimposed with the faces of the Jenner sisters. The audacity. <laughs> Why would you do this? Why would you do this? Which was available on KendallKylie.com for $125 each. Social media was outraged and questioned why the sisters felt compelled to print their faces over the original artworks of musical icons. And because of this, Valletta Wallace, Notorious B.I.G.'s mother, criticized the Jenners in an Instagram post while a lawyer for the rapper's estate threatened legal action should the vintage shirts continue to be sold on their site. In the post, Wallace also claimed that they had not been contacted with a request to use his image. I'm not sure who told Kylie Jenner and Kendall Jenner that they had the right to do this. Wallace's post read, The disrespect of these girls to not even reach out to me or anyone connected to the estate baffles me. I have no idea why they feel they can exploit the deaths of Tupac and my son Christopher to sell a t-shirt. This is disrespectful, disgusting, and exploitation at its worst. Wallace's lawyer also issued a cease and desist letter to the sisters. Ozzy Osbourne's wife, Sharon Osbourne, also criticized the t-shirts, tweeting, Girls, you haven't earned the right to put your face with musical icons. Stick to what you know. Lip gloss. According to the Rolling Stone, former American rock band The Doors also sent a cease and desist letter to the Jenner sisters over the controversial line of t-shirts. Jeff Jampol, manager of The Doors and the Jim Morrison estate, spoke out to the pair for their decision to sell the unauthorized clothing. This is a case of people who fashion themselves as celebrities who are famous for being well-known but don't actually do anything, trying to utilize and steal and capitalize on the legacies of those who actually did do something and created amazing art and messages, Jampol said. It's ironic, at least, and criminal at worst, both morally, ethically, and artistically. Kendall and Kylie Jenner both issued identical messages on Twitter in response to the controversy which read, These designs were not well thought out and we deeply apologize to anyone that has been upset and or offended, especially to the families of the artists. We are huge fans of their music and it was not our intention to disrespect these cultural icons in any way. The t-shirts have been pulled from retail and all images have been removed. We will use this as an opportunity to learn from these mistakes and again, we are very sorry. Then months after the vintage t-shirt controversy, the company the company came under fire again when they released a bag on the Saks Fifth Avenue website that raised many eyebrows. The handbag cost $150 and was designed to resemble a Chinese takeout container named Lee Clutch. The front of the bag read KK Express, Los Angeles, California, and the words are accompanied by the drawing of a tiger. Teen Vogue noted that the bag's name featured a common Asian last name. Not only did the bag raise concerns of cultural appropriation, Creation, but others were quick to point out that the bag also looked oddly similar to one of Kate Spade's handbags from its Shanghai-inspired Fall 2014 line. Despite all of these controversies, the Kendall Kylie clothing brand still exists today and is still being sold in various stores. And oddly, out of all the Kardashian fashion lines and clothing stores, seems to be the most successful and profitable, even though it's simultaneously seen as a complete joke. Joke.
In 2016, Emma Greed and Khloe Kardashian founded Good American. Based in Los Angeles, the fashion brand offers trend-driven denim designs and preaches body positivity and inclusivity, and carries sizes from double zero to 24. I really wanted to get involved with Good American is because I believe that there is a huge missing link to the denim community. And I know with me and all my girlfriends, all we ever do is talk about that gap in the back of your jeans. And no matter what size you are, if you're a two or a 32, you always have that gap because women's waists are smaller than their hips and booty. And I wanted to make a denim line that was made to fit the female shape and not making us to fit a denim line. Does that make sense? Um, Its launch campaign brought in $1 million on its first day. Controversy for the brand started in March 2, 2017, when the brand released new styles of pants, including a pair of black skinnies that lace up the sides, all the way from mid-thigh to ankle. People quickly compared the new release to a product made by Made Gold, seen on celebrities such as Kylie and Gigi and Bella Hadid. Good American's lace-up style is priced at $189 and Made Gold's is priced at $2.98, meaning Good American just slightly undercuts the price of Made Gold's. On top of that, Good American's lace-up pants gained more exposure due to its famous co-founder. The owner of Made Gold concluded, it's such a blatant ripoff of a small brand, and hopefully other brands think twice before trying to make a dime off of an independent designer's talent. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like a Good American learned their lesson, because on June June 2nd, 2017, controversy struck again for the company when indie designer Destiny Blue alleged that Good American copied her designs and sold them under their brand name without compensating her for her designs. Blue took to Twitter and tweeted, When someone buys one of everything on your site, has you make them custom at Blue Dazzle work, never posts it or wears it, then copies it, and tagged Chloe. She also posted pictures of Chloe wearing a sheer black bedazzled dazzled leotard beside a similar catsuit from her line. Chloe's team responded to the accusations with a cease and desist letter via Good American, claiming that under no circumstances had copying occurred and that the problem was being handled through legal procedures. Blue then provided Refinery29 with a copy of her June 8th response to Chloe Kardashian and Good American, which was full of correspondence that proved that the Good American team has been in touch with her since November of 2016. The correspondence also showed that Kardashian's then stylist Monica Rose contacted Blue to borrow black and nude bodysuits and bras, which Blue claimed were later also knocked off by Good Americans. In May 2020, Destiny Blue's company Blue Dazzled officially filed a lawsuit against Good American, seeking damage repair of $10 million. By May of 2021, the two reached an agreement in private and both officially asked the court to close the case. And speaking of copying, can we just quickly and briefly talk about the similarities of Poosh, a blog and woo-woo wellness store created by Kourtney Kardashian, and Goop, a blog and woo-woo store created by Gwyneth Paltrow years before the creation and inception of Poosh? I mean, don't get me wrong, Goop has been the source of tons of online internet jokes and jests, and also has had multiple lawsuits filed against it. A lot of people see Goop as a total joke, but it's still kind of a little odd and a little shady and unoriginal that Kourtney Kardashian basically took the exact same layout of Goop, sells similar overpriced products, writes similar blogs, and even has two O's in the name, basically going copy and paste of everything that Goop is doing, but rebranding it as a Kardashian website.
In early June 2017, Kylie Jenner dropped some additions to her Kylie shop that looked similar to designs from black-owned independent brand Plugged NYC. Kylie's two-piece sets closely resemble the bright orange camo threads created by the shop's designer Tazita Balimle. Celebrities like Rihanna, Kiki Palmer, and Jenner herself were seen dressed in Balimle's pieces. On the day of Kylie's drop, Plugged NYC CEO and creator Creative director Tazita shared images on their Instagram story that showed side-by-side -side comparisons of the two designs and screenshots of Balimle's emails showing that Jenner had ordered clothes from Plugged NYC in the past. Overall, it just seems like the Kardashian-Jenner sisters are shameless. They'll steal from artists and other creatives, rebrand them, put their face on them. It seems like anything but actually create their own body of original creative work. The Kardashian-Jenner's digital properties, launched in 2015, were developed and managed by Whale Rock Industries. The very first app with the Kardashian name was Kim Kardashian Hollywood Game, which may have grossed the star and development partner $200 million in annual revenue, according to some reports at the time. And by 2015, the entire family got involved, seeing a huge, huge cash grab opportunity. The Kardashian and Jenner sisters all launched their own subscription apps by late 2015, all of which shot up into the app store's top charts. The Kardashian-Jenner apps had a freemium business model where the basic app was free, but if you paid an extra $2.99 a month, you could get access to exclusive content. With such a strong start, the app seemed poised to generate millions and millions per year. However, by 2018, it appeared that each app started tanking and badly. According to App Annie, everyone's apps struggled to make the overall ranking, which meant they were somewhere lower than number 1500 on the App Store. Kendall Jenner was the first sister to shut down her app and site sometime in 2018. Then, on December 19th of 2019, the rest of the Kardashian-Jenner sisters followed in Kendall's footsteps and all shut down their apps. We've had an incredible experience connecting with all of you through our apps these past few years, but have made the difficult decision to no longer continue updating in 2019, Kim wrote in a message on her website. We truly hope you've enjoyed this journey as much as we have and we look forward to what's ahead. And identical notes were posted on all of the sisters' websites. Creating an app is really challenging and requires a lot of ongoing expenses paid out to developers because there's constant updates, bug fixes, and the like that has to be done and paying for a developer continually can be expensive. So so if you're not generating a decent amount of money, it becomes unprofitable very quickly. And this is something a lot of celebrities and influencers don't really understand about apps, which is why so many apps created by celebrities and influencers end up failing and shutting down. Before Kylie Jenner's famous makeup line and Kim Kardashian's eventual makeup line, there was Kardashian Beauty, which was the Kardashian's very first makeup line and was sold at Ulta. I remember seeing reviews of this makeup line saying it was absolutely terrible and the line ended up discontinuing. The line was launched in 2012 and was called Chroma Beauty, but was eventually renamed to Kardashian Beauty after multiple lawsuits of copyright infringement. But the brand fizzled out after terrible reviews and poor quality and inevitably a lack of sales. Years and years later, Kim Kardashian started a makeup line after her sister's brand Kylie Cosmetics seemingly became a massive hit. Kim Kardashian named the line KKW Beauty, but there wasn't really the same massive response to KKW Beauty and it never really found its hero product. Then in August of 2021, Kim announced that KKW Beauty's website will be shutting down with a rebrand coming soon. And KKW Beauty's inventory before this was being sold off at heavily discounted prices. It seems that the beauty industry has taken a huge dip from the boom it saw in 2016, and a lot of brands are now closing or rebranding. I think Kim assumed that KKW Beauty would become a massive success because of her sister's brand, 
and her following, but this just doesn't seem to be the case, especially considering KKW Beauty's initial launch of the contour sticks received very poor reviews for the minimal product and the breakage of the product and the poor quality of the brushes. I'm also not complaining about the size, I just think relative to the price, it may be a little bit expensive. Oh, yeah! Girl, Kim! Girl, you tried it, girl. That's all you get when you know. While Kim's makeup line doesn't seem to be doing the greatest, her company Skims, a shapewear and loungewear line, has actually become a massive success, with many loving the fabric and quality of the brand. So it's the exact same as my black slip dress that I brag so much about, except for it's the shorter version. So I was really excited to see the shorter version because I was like, oh my god, I love the dark palm one so so much. They have a new short version. I'm buying it in all versions. So freaking good. This dress looks really cute. I'm not gonna lie. It looks like the length of it is perfect and I love that I chose this color because it looks like a very nude skin color moment and I feel like it's gonna be one of those things that you put on your body and it feels kind of like barely there. So my hopes for this one are high. Wow. Okay. I love this. The material of it feels really, really cozy and comfortable. I like how fitted the arm is. I love this little section for some reason. Skims, like I pictured this. I picture luxury, at home, comfort, like what? Then why does it cost that much? But when I got it, I was like, the quality is amazing. Like this is mad, cool, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. I was with it, you know, I was there. I saw, I saw her vision. So now the question is, girl, did the vision see me? No, it did not. In fact, the company is so successful that the New York Times put the company's valuation at 1.6 billion last April. But I think a lot of people forget how the brand started. In 2019, Kim Kardashian West changed the name of her then newly launched shapewear brand from kimono to skims when the former sparked criticism of cultural appropriation. It's funny how quickly we all forgot about the initial name of the brand being kimono, and I personally think that this initial name wasn't intended to be the lifelong name of the brand and is really just an example of outrage marketing, something the Kardashians are truly a case study for. In fact, the Kardashians have managed to walk the line of making people angry enough so that they talk about them, but not so angry so that the Kardashians can still turn things around and maintain general support. At the end of the day, we've all been played by them for free outrage tweets and publicity, whether you love or hate them and whether we like it or not. In 2014, Kylie Jenner and Chris founded the company Kylie Cosmetics, which they first named Kylie Lip Kits. Quiet on the set! Shut up! Just kidding. Seeing it go from literally three lip kits in 2015, so six years later with Kylie Cosmetics, the global empire. I just feel so grateful to be working with Kylie and Chris. This is just the start, really. Kylie is so smart, so creative, so full of ideas. She truly disrupted the entire beauty business and the industry. They partnered with Seed Beauty, a retail and product development company co-founded by siblings John and Laura Nelson. Jenner has described her former insecurity about her lip size as inspiration for why she started her brand. When I was younger, I had an insecurity with my lips. I would go to makeup stores at the mall and just find like lip liner that matched my lip color and just would overline my lips. I became obsessed with makeup in general. I did my makeup so fast. I'm just not feeling myself. Your lips look amazing. Really? I have temporary lip fillers. It's just an insecurity of mine and it's what I wanted to do. We all struggle with something. And when we struggle with things, they kind of spiral out of control from time to time. The company's first product, Kylie Lip Kits, a liquid lipstick and lip liner, debuted on November 30th, 2015. And in February 2016, the company was renamed Kylie Cosmetics with plans to expand outside of just lip kits. And it was reported that by the end of 2016, the
the company's total revenue was over 300 million. There were some initial controversies, like some lip kits that exhibited poor quality, broken wands, dried out bottles, things of that nature. But most of the controversies surrounding the brand wouldn't happen till a few years later. Kylie Cosmetics also launched a brush set, which was very expensive and criticized for the poor quality brushes they had. Prominent beauty influencer Jackie Ina uploaded an official review of the Kylie Cosmetics products to her YouTube channel titled Kylie Concealers vs. Colourpop, where Jackie compared Colourpop products to Kylie's more expensive line. Both Colourpop and Kylie Cosmetics are manufactured by the same parent company, Seed Beauty, meaning that the concealers were likely at least somewhat similar in composition. However, there's a huge price difference with Kylie Jenner selling her concealers for $20 at the time and Colourpop selling their concealers for $6. Jackie Ina also criticized Kylie for allegedly only gifting her concealers to lighter skin toned beauty influencers, failing to promote the darker tones. Let's not act like Kylie's not known for like stealing inspo from other people. Like, like that whole blowout she had with Lana, like, what, that was like less than two years ago. She literally stole and copied imagery from a not as well known artist, but someone who's very popular. So my question was like, how long did she think she was gonna get away with that? Cause like Lana's kind of a big deal. Lana, I believe, did sue her. Um, yeah, she was sued by Lana. She stole some imagery, was like inspired, inspired, <laughs> inspired by her imagery and used it, Kylie had used it for her lip campaigns when she first came out. I feel like she's doing what everyone else is doing, not necessarily in a good way. Even down to like her imagery for the brand, like this is the sleeve that the concealer box comes in. I saw some side-by-side -side comparison of like Venti's imagery compared to Kylie's imagery for her concealers. And I, I was like, ooh, when you look at it, when you look at it that way, I don't know, sis. It's not looking too good for you. I do. I'm also very curious to know with Kylie's like outreach and like her social media. I mean, you went out of your way to make all of these beautiful bottom row of darker colors, but I didn't see a single person on YouTube outside of Shayla. Shayla, I don't see any bloggers reviewing these products. I mean, I I'm not on her PR list, and I'm most certainly not the only black out there. But I'm just saying, why did you go out of your way to make all of those shades? and you didn't bother to send them to anybody to review. I mean, I, I would think that if you're gonna create the product, you're also going to probably take more, you're probably also gonna take a more holistic approach to expanding your brand, right? I wanna see some reviews from some chocolate girls. I I just wanna know where are they? Next shade is Kiki. It's literally like putting chalky paste on your lips. Oh God. Mm. <laughs> okay. Mm. Then sometime later in May of 2019, Kylie launched Kylie Skin, a vegan skincare line within the sort of Kylie Cosmetics umbrella. But a lot of skincare experts criticize a lot of the ingredients and products within the line, more particularly the walnut scrub, which has been shown to kind of damage skin and not be the best thing for your skin in the long run. Alright, let's talk about walnut scrub. So my walnut face scrub, it's really gentle. It's gentle enough to use every day. I recommend two or three times a week. That's how much I use it. The next concern about the walnut powder is that it causes micro tears in the skin. There is a class action lawsuit against St. Ives for their apricot scrub because the customers claim that the walnut powder caused micro tears in the skin due to the jagged edges of the walnut shell, which was used in this case for exfoliating. And this promoted acne and other skin issues due to these tears in the skin. In fact, the St. Ives apricot scrub was the subject of a 2017 lawsuit where plaintiffs claimed the physical exfoliant created microscopic tears in their skin, leaving it vulnerable to bacteria and causing long-term damage and sensitivity. In 2020, Cody Incorporated bought 51% of Kylie Cosmetics in a deal valued at $1.2 billion. Earlier, 
the previous year, Forbes declared Kylie Jenner a billionaire due to the financial documents that her and her mom showed the magazine. She convinced Forbes reporters that her company was doing more than $300 million in annual revenue, when in reality, it only did $125 million that year, which is of course still a lot of money, but Kylie and her mom drastically exaggerated these sales just so she could be named the youngest billionaire. The truth about Kylie's financial status only came out when the acquisition with Cody Inc. happened. To quote Forbes, in the deal between Cody and Kylie Cosmetics, a less flattering truth emerged. Filings released by publicly traded Cody over the past six months lay bare one of the family's best kept secrets. Kylie's business is significantly smaller and less profitable than the family has spent years leading the cosmetic industry and media outlets including Forbes to believe. I'm Kylie Jenner and I am the founder of Kylie Cosmetics. I had an insecurity with my lips when I was younger, so I turned to makeup to help me feel more confident. Starting a company on my own and it being so big from the beginning, there's not a lot of room for mistakes. And now in 2021 and 2022, after a decline in cosmetics companies, how is Kylie Cosmetics faring? Well, Kylie, alongside Kim and KKW Beauty, also announced a rebrand of Kylie Cosmetics. Kylie 2.0 was always in the plan. I've learned so much, so much more than what I knew when I started Kylie Cosmetics. Kylie's evolved over the last six years. We're re-envisioning some of the stuff that she has that is iconic, like the lip kit. You can always take something to the next level. The girls are always trying to be the best that they can be, and especially applies to Kylie. And Kylie felt like it was really time to redirect the nature of the brand. It can be cleaner, it can be more elevated, it can be more beautiful. There's a movement towards more clean. There's also been better innovation in formula and technology over the course of the last few years. Being clean and vegan and cruelty-free and paraben-free, all these things are really important to me now. And I want to just be really proud of everything that I release. With apparently a new vegan formula launching. While vegan formulas are more popular, is there actually more at play behind the scenes? than just an attempt to keep up with consumer preferences. He was that frustrated. He kept buying the paying $17 for things that were just, you know, pitiful. Like, it started to become consistent that Kelly Cosmetics was not worth the price you were paying for. It just got, you know, over and over and over again, we're seeing more incidents where the product sucked. She was, I guess, called out for repackaging shades. If you were paying for the same shade, there were different packages, you paid more. And that brush launch was the moment that everybody turned on Kylie Cosmetics. That was the fall of Kylie Cosmetics, was that, that final launch after Beauty came out, where you saw all the beauty gurus, all the big people on YouTube, pretty much saying that, no, you have lost your mind. At this point, nobody cared about Kylie Cosmetics. And then I have the, I didn't have the, you know, the same hype that it once did, because we had finally, finally, Two, three years after release, we were finally seeing that it was all a scam. In June of 2020, Forbes reported that Seed Beauty, the company that manufactured both KKW and Kylie Cosmetics, filed a lawsuit against Cody Inc who owns both Kylie and 20% of KKW Beauty, where Seed Beauty claims Kylie shared their trade secrets. Kylie Cosmetics has also been accused of copying packaging and ripping off various ideas as well, but really, what's new in the Kardashian world? I am really curious about the future of Kylie Cosmetics and whether it'll start to fizzle out, considering from the very beginning, the entire family has lied about the success of Kylie Cosmetics and the the company has seemed to be going more and more downhill since then. It feels weird that this is my life now. Bye bye, mommy. Bye, bye, love you. Looking back at it though, makeup has just been a part of my DNA. This is just so exciting. Kylie Jenner released her lipstick at 9 a.m. this morning, and the kit sold out in just a matter of minutes. She just announced it on social media. My lip kits are up and within seconds it was gone. And I was like, what? We should have ordered more lip kits. Oh no. It started off as Lip Kit by Kylie. Then when I realized 
after the first launch that it could be something that I've always dreamed about, a real cosmetics line, then I changed it to Kylie Cosmetics. On February 16th, 2021, Kendall Jenner announced the launch of her tequila company, 818. While some applauded her ability to secretly launch an award-winning tequila company, others called out Kendall's appropriation of Mexican culture. Kendall Jenner shared a campaign shot from an agave farm in Mexico, which raised many red flags online. On Instagram, Jenner posted the controversial shots from the ad campaign, saying, what an incredible experience. Experience I've had thus far. Learning about this beautiful place, its beautiful culture, and the beautiful people. In the imagery, Kendall can be seen riding a horse through rows of agave plants. In another photo, the model was sipping her tequila on the back of a pickup truck. There were several photos of agave farmers and another of agave cooking in an oven. Kendall's attire in the photos also garnered controversy. Viewers online pointed out her choice to wear an outfit and hairstyle traditionally associated with Mexican culture. Many called out the look as cultural appropriation or as an attempt at migrant chic. Given that Kendall is American, many applied that the campaign and tequila brand itself are capitalizing on stereotypes typically associated with farmers in Mexico. Tequila is a significant part of Mexico and its culture. Kendall later defended her brand, claiming that the company was making efforts to support the community. But Kendall has never confronted the cultural appropriation accusations and chose to turn off her comment section on Instagram for a brief time during the peak of the controversy. It seems that Kendall's businesses seem to always be shrouded in blindness of her privilege. It seems that Kendall Jenner, out of all the Kardashian Jenner sisters, is the one that always tries to spin a positive message out of her business endeavors. But instead, her messaging always comes across as tone deaf. I personally think this is because because Kendall Jenner can't actually relate or understand many of the issues and activism she tries to take a role in. Kendall Jenner, alongside Kylie Jenner, were both really young when the Kardashians rose to fame, and throughout almost their entire lives, all they've known was fame and fortune. But instead of recognizing this privilege, Kendall Jenner seems to try and take an approach of acting like an activist without actually doing the work and through only trying to promote her own business. Businesses. And the reality is, people have seen right through that. And at this point, it's almost comical because you'll never guess the latest news regarding the Kardashian Jenners. And that's that Kendall Jenner's tequila brand was accused of blatantly copying Tequila 512 in a lawsuit that Tequila 512 made against 818. And if you look at the side by side comparison of the two tequila bottles, I mean, I'm not gonna say anything definitive, but definitely suspicious. Kylie Jenner debuted her new swimwear brand, Kylie Swim, in an Instagram post on August 17th, 2021. She later announced on September 13th that Kylie Swim would release its first collection for sale on September 17th. WWD reported on May 21st, despite the optimism behind the brand, Kylie Swim received tons and tons of negative reviews from consumers who accused Kylie of selling poor quality swimsuits, many people filming and uploading videos of the swimsuits showing bad stitching and completely see-through fabric, which is kind of a bad idea for bathing suits. Oh, okay, here we go. This is like our first sign of some problem here. Here around the crotch area, we have a little bit of fraying here. Honestly, nothing that would normally concern me, like I would never even notice that. But that's the first sign of like wear on some of these swimsuits. So let's put this spaghetti noodle on. I just can't unsee like a banana hammock in this. I don't know why. When I first saw this, I was like, is that like a banana hammock? Because that's what it feels like. Ah, oh, there's so much going on. Oh no. Look at on the back. Oh! You can see the Kylie swimwear logo. That's on the inside. I think it's right here. See? You can see through it. She wasn't expecting this reaction. An insider confessed exclusively to life in style. She's really freaking out over all the hateful reviews. The source continued. Well, then maybe make 
better quality products. Just a suggestion. Kylie used to feel like everything she touched turned to gold, but that just isn't true anymore and she's really upset. It seems in recent years, business-wise, Kylie Jenner specifically has had the biggest downfall. Kylie Cosmetics is sort of declining and all of Kylie Jenner's recent attempts at new product launches have not been taking off. And it makes me wonder, is the allure and success of the Kardashian empire starting to fade? And are people no longer trusting that the Kardashians are going to produce good quality products? And also, who would blame them? One could say most of the Kardashian businesses have had some sort of major issue involved with them. And the Kardashians, as business people creating an entire brand and family empire, cannot seem to produce a quality product and a quality business. <laughs> And that brings us to 2021 and 2022, and unfortunately, one of the saddest events that the Kardashians and the Kardashian-Jenner family have been involved in. Kylie Jenner's baby daddy and co-parent Travis Scott <laughs> a musical artist, hosted a music festival called Astroworld in late 2021 that resulted in tragedy. On November 5th of 2021, chaos erupted in the crowd at what should have been a normal concert. It's an estimated 50,000 people gathered at Travis Scott's Astroworld Music Festival. As the event progressed, the panic ensued. The crowd surged and many concert goers trampled others, ultimately leaving at least 10 people dead and hundreds more injured. The tragedy left many questioning how the concert continued for so long, turning it into one of the most deadly concerts in U.S. history. Yeah, within the last hour, Cheryl, local officials were able to give us a few more details about their preliminary investigation. However, you're right, we still have a lot more questions. First. I want to tell you about the ages of some of the victims. Uh, one was 14, one was 16, two were 21, two were 23, one was 27, and the age of the last person remains unknown at this time. In total, there were eight people who died. 13 people are still hospitalized. Five of them are minors. We're told a 10-year-old is still in the hospital tonight in critical condition. Due to a crowd surge, hundreds of people were injured and 10 people lost their lives at the concert, which should just never be a thing from attending a concert. Since then, Scott has been named in a ton of lawsuits, mounting to $3 billion. But him and the Kardashians, namely Kylie Jenner, who attended the event, have remained silent. But overall, I want to extend my heart out to the victims and the families involved in the tragedy. It's so heartbreaking and I'm sure so disheartening to see the lack of reaction from those involved and close with those involved in the concert. The Kardashians have made a name for themselves off of fame, glory, and glamour, but the world behind it is one riddled with dark, failed businesses, lawsuits, scams, and shady tactics to try and profit off of the fans who look up to them. The Kardashian image is tactically created and planned, but behind it all is the graveyard of failed businesses and mishaps. So what does this make the Kardashian empire if it's built on shaky foundations? Is this a story about business redemption and the idea that even if you fail numerous times, you can still have at least one business venture that becomes a massive success? Or is it a story about manipulation, greed, and stealing money from fans through these fake, shady, uncertain business ventures that often result in failure? The Kardashians are intricately tied into the business endeavors that they've been participating in from the very start, and yet much of these business endeavors equate to nothing. It seems that the Kardashian businesses are as much of an illusion as the image that they put out itself. Photoshopped 
and fake to appear glamorous, but really it's all just an illusion. And that's the end of this video on the dark truth of the Kardashian businesses. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end if you're currently watching. I really appreciate it considering the massive amount of time that I pour into these videos. I hope you guys are all doing well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.